Hi there, my name is Meredith Polsky. I am a founder of an organization called Matan. We focus entirely on Jewish disability inclusion across North America, helping the Jewish community be as inclusive as possible uh, for people with, with and without disabilities. And for GRAT, I am really honored to teach a course on disability inclusion in Jewish education. And uh, just by way of background, I'm a clinical social worker and a special educator, and I've been with Matan for the past uh, about 23 years since it started. So I am going to go ahead and share my screen so you can see uh, some slides that I'm going to put up here. So when I think about disability inclusion, you know, sometimes I talk to people about this and people might say, oh, you know, it seems like just recently that like this is really coming up or, oh, I never really heard this, you know, until the past number of years. Um, and it's funny because in actuality, the idea of inclusivity um, in Jewish life really goes far back to the very beginning, right? Our, our Jewish texts even include a lot of information on expectations about inclusivity. Um, and so I listed just a few here, just for your reference. Different people will have different preferences, right? About what really speaks to them. Um, but this idea uh, for, for this course, especially educate each child according to his or her way. Um, from Proverbs is really sort of, you know, what I would say almost gave me the impetus, right, for starting something like Matan, because it didn't feel right to me that somehow in the Jewish community, we were deciding who could and could not be part of Jewish education programs. Um, and that if we were educating each child according to their way, then there wouldn't be, um, you know, th this this form of exclusion uh, and, and really sort of from an, from an outside perspective, you know, deciding who could be in and who can't be in. So we can think about really our own experiences in Jewish education or in secular education. Usually people will start thinking about uh, things that they've seen that have been really successfully inclusive or even that they've experienced or things they've seen or experienced that were specifically not inclusive that they would like to do differently or they would have liked to have done differently. So why is this such an issue in the Jewish community, right? Why are we even talking about this? So it's actually not a small number of children that we're talking about. We know um, from the secular world that about 15 to 20 percent of children between 3 and 21 have a diagnosed learning disability. We also know that at this point in uh, the United States, one in 44 children is diagnosed with autism. So there actually haven't been uh, real studies done on the Jewish population when it comes to uh, disability. So at Matan, what we tend to do um, is extrapolate what we know of uh, the secular statistics and think about the number of Jews that there are. And so we can safely assume that there are at least 200,000 kids in the Jewish community with some sort of special need, right? And some will say that that's even um, underestimating the number. So thinking about that and thinking about maybe what comes to mind when you hear the word disability, right? A disability can impact any number of things. So for some people, the first thing that comes to mind is really a physical disability, right? You might think of a person using a wheelchair. Uh, you might think of a person who is blind, right? But it could be physical, it could be cognitive, right? Like a learning disability or something that affects the way a person is able to think and learn. It could be a disability around self-help skills, um, ability to eat, dress, be able to take care of oneself. It could be a disability that impacts speech and language, right? That ability to talk and express needs. And, or it could be social emotional development, right? And our ability to relate to other people in a way that maybe is expected, right? So a disability can impact one or more of these things. So going backwards a little bit, right? Because it's hard to think about Jewish disability inclusion um, without 
also recognizing what has gone on, um, at least in the United States, in terms of disability inclusion and disability rights. So I put in just a little bit of information because I know we don't necessarily want to go through, you know, all the dates and sort of the, the more mundane aspects of this. Um, but I think it's really important to recognize that um, back in 1975, right, is when people in, in my field will say PL 94142, right? That's the public law, Education for All Handicapped Children Act. And this is really when we came to have some things that that may sound familiar, right? If you've if you've been in classrooms already, um, depending on where you are um, in terms of your um, you know career at at Gratz College and beyond, but you may have heard uh, the idea of an IEP, an individualized education plan, and maybe you've also heard of LRE, which is a least least restrictive environment. And basically, this provided um, a legal mandate for kids to be able to learn in the ways that work for them in a way that is that takes into account their sort of highest level of functioning, so to speak, right? So if they are really strong in math and science, for example, but have a language, a language related disability that impacts their um, success in let's say English and history, then they're required to be in the highest thing that they can handle that works and is suitable for them in those sciences, I forgot what examples I gave, but in those sciences and maths, right? And then if they need to have extra support in those other subjects, then that's where the support comes in. And the reason for this is because it used to be that any kid with any kind of disability was kind of thrown into one classroom, right? And you saw in a previous slide that if a disability can impact any area of development, right? One might be affected, whereas one other area might not be affected at all. It really does not make sense to have just, you know, all kids with, with all kinds of disabilities in one classroom. So this really safeguarded against that and recognized um, that children have uh, strengths along with their uh, disability, and we wanna make sure that they are receiving um, a free and appropriate education that suits their needs. So it was only in 1990 that we have the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. You might've heard of this, IDEA. Um, this, this put into place a few other safeguards, right? So first of all, change the name of handicapped children to children with disabilities. Ex it extended some laws, right, to offer various services um, for toddlers through adult employment. And it really added safeguards um, so that child rights were protected and so that the school and the family was um, in communication with one another. And that's a really, really broad general idea of what has happened sort of historically in terms of um, disability lawmaking, right? And there have been lots of movements, disability movement, lots of things that have been advocated for, um, you know, in the intervening years. Um, but these are the things that really sort of kicked off this whole idea of inclusion in educational settings. And so here we're talking about Jewish education. And so I like to think about or have you consider what the implications might be, right, of the statistics, the number of people, the number of children who have some form of disability in the United States, these laws that are still evolving, what are the implications for the Jewish community? I want to pause for a second so that you're thinking about it too. So when I think about this, I think about a few different things. First of all, parents who have kids with disabilities become intimately familiar with these laws. They are often their children's best advocates, and sometimes they have to push for the things that their children are entitled to. These same parents become very accustomed, as they should, right, to getting the support services that their child needs in secular school, because it's the law. And so then maybe they come to the religious school setting and they expect those same accommodations or modifications 
to be in place at the religious school, right? The problem is that our religious schools, even if it's a Jewish day school or an afternoon Hebrew school, most Jewish day schools, I should say, um, don't are not mandated by these laws, right, as religious institutions. And so a parent might have their child in your religious school program wondering, right, and maybe being frustrated by the fact that that child is not receiving uh, the supports that um, they're receiving in secular school and therefore are not being successful. The other thing, I think, uh, another implication that I think about is that although these things are are mandated and they're they're legally mandated in public schools, it's not like it's handed to families on a silver platter, right? Families still have to do their fair share of advocacy. They have to stay on top of it. They have to, you know, add things in when when new challenges come up. Um, and there are lots of other environments other than just school where these parents are constantly, constantly advocating, right, and fighting for their kids. And I think about this idea of the Jewish community. And if I were a parent who was constantly doing this advocating, I could see really not wanting to do that uh, in my spiritual home right or in the place where my family attends synagogue in the place where my child attends religious school i could really imagine thinking this is my jewish home right they should take my child and accept my child for whoever they are and i am tired of advocating i am tired of fighting and i don't want to do that in my synagogue right and so i think it's important to um, sort of take that perspective and understand uh, where families might be coming from, right? We often get complaints that parents don't share information about their children, and we'll get to that a little bit later on too. Um, but I think understanding sort of what children are legally entitled to in the secular world versus where we are in the Jewish world is really important to take into account. So in my opinion, in this, you know, in the secular world, there's this legal mandate, and there's not this same mandate in our Jewish educational world or in our synagogues, right? But I would argue that we do have a moral mandate, right? And so, as Jewish educators, I think we need to be thinking about those the, those lines, right, between a moral mandate and a legal one. And think about do we really want to just fall on the side of what we have to do legally, or do we really want to fall on the side of what we know is our moral obligation um, of being inclusive, inclusive of as a Jewish community. The Jewish community we know lags behind the secular world when it comes to inclusion and even those uh, laws that I that I had up earlier, you know they don't date back that far. Right. And so it's not like the United States has been doing this, you know, for the last hundred years. It's really much more recent than that. But even more so for the Jewish community, we were late to even start thinking about these issues. And so whether or not we would be legally mandated, um, we are behind the eight ball at this point because it's just not something that was taken into account um, for a long time. And the third thing I really want to emphasize in terms of the Jewish imperative for inclusivity is this idea of how an individual with special needs or disabilities can have a drastic effect on how the entire family is included in Jewish life. Right. So if we have a child who is counseled out of religious school, right, because we're not able to meet their needs, what do you think? that does for the family, right? Do you think that family really wants to come into synagogue for services, right? Do you really think that family is comfortable sending their other children to a religious school where one of their kids is not able to be? Or even a child who, you know, maybe is disruptive in a, in a Shabbat service, right? If somebody tells them that they shouldn't be there, well, then the whole family is not gonna be there. And we've heard so many stories at Matan doing this work for a while, where it's not just the immediate family that's affected. It's the aunts and uncles and grandparents and cousins who all leave a particular Jewish community 
because one child with a special need or disability was not able to be included and that did not work for anyone in their family. So in this image, you'll see three different things. Right, probably pretty clear in the first image, you see three children on one box each, right? And they're trying to watch this baseball game. And in the second image, you see those boxes distributed a little bit differently, right? So in that first image, you could see that the first child didn't really need the box in order to see the baseball game. The second child, it was perfect, right? It was exactly what he needed to be able to see the game. And the third child, he got a box, but it really didn't help. He can't see the game anyway, right? So in that second image, those three boxes are just distributed differently so that everybody is able to see the baseball game, right? One box went to that middle child for whom it worked the first time. And then the child on the end got two boxes and now he's able to see the game as well, right? And I, I put this out there partly because sometimes we think that, you know, being inclusive is gonna be so expensive it really does not necessarily have to be expensive, right? We think about the resources that we already have, um, not just financial, but um, physical materials, you know, all these things. And we think about what makes sense in terms of how to distribute those resources, right? Let's distribute them in a way that actually makes an impact for each student. But even more importantly is this third image, right? Where you could see that instead of the the um the wooden fence that was built they thought ahead and they built a wire fence that anybody could see through and be able to watch the game right and this is known as you might have heard um universal design theory um at matan we sometimes call it inclusion by design it's really setting things up from the beginning right so if you're teaching in a classroom it's setting up your classroom from the beginning so that the majority of kids needs can be met right I think the hardest thing about inclusion and, and kind of why it's been so tricky for the Jewish community to catch up is because the Jewish community wasn't designed with inclusion in mind from the outset right and it's actually harder to make something inclusive after you've already sort of planned the whole thing rather than to build in inclusivity from the beginning Right, so when you're thinking about your classrooms, when you're thinking about your lesson plans, and of course we're going to learn how to do this, but think about this wire fence, right, and think about this idea that you want your classroom set up, you want your lessons prepared in such a way that there are various points of access, right, that people with different needs, different types of disabilities, different types of, um, you know, learning needs, whatever it might be, have the ability to access the content in the way that these three children now have the ability to access the baseball game really without any extra resources being put towards it. So in our last couple of minutes together, and we're going to have so much more time to explore inclusion and um, uh, special education and different different learning needs within a classroom and all of those things. But I wanna leave you with this idea of what inclusion is, right? It's really not about money. It's really not even about those resources. It's really about an attitude and an approach, right? When you come into a situation, any situation, right? Here we're talking about your classroom, whether it's formal Jewish education or informal Jewish education, um, we are really sort of encouraging you right to think about this from the start and to make sure that it's part of your mindset and to make sure that that inclusion mindset is an attitude of acceptance right and an attitude of wanting to get this right and wanting everybody to be able to meaningfully participate and also recognizing that we are not going to get it right every single time and I think sometimes what happens for teachers or for uh, Jewish communal professionals, I think sometimes what happens is that we're afraid that we are not going to get it 100% right. And so we don't even take that first step. And I want to encourage all of us to make sure that we think about inclusion as an attitude and an approach 
and don't hold ourselves back because we're we're afraid to get something wrong right we need to keep asking questions we need to keep being in conversation with people with disabilities with educators with parents right to understand how we can get this right and to make sure that those lines of communication are open so i look forward to continuing to learn with you and um, I will see you soon for the rest of this Gratz College course. Thank you.